from his book, God in the Wasteland. David Wells writes this. A God with whom we are on easy terms and whose reality is little different from our own, who is merely there to satisfy our needs, has no real authority to compel and will soon begin to bore us. L let me read it again in case you weren't ready. A God with whom we're on easy terms and whose reality is little different from our own, who is merely there to satisfy our, satisfy our needs, has no real authority to compel and will soon begin to bore us. I I'm afraid that so much of modern Christianity what we call worship or preaching or worship services, frankly, has become boring, but boring for all the wrong reasons. Boring not because the quality's not there or the words aren't true. Boring because we become bored with God himself. Because we can only be fed a steady diet of self-help for so long. We can only be saturated with our own perceived needs and, and desires for so long till we begin to lose sight of the absolute imminence of God. I was reading this sort of exchange of, I don't know, I wouldn't call it exactly ideas, exchange of inanities um, on social media the other day about going to church and why I just don't like going to church anymore. And I don't need church to know God. And I thought it's not so much the people that you become bored with and it's not... So much the worship services that are at issue, it's God himself. It's God himself, and he doesn't weigh heavily on us anymore. My challenge to you today as I approach a text, I'm beginning today sort of a sub-series of sermons within the scope of the Gospel of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best-known collection of teachings of Jesus. It's also the most misunderstood, and the least obeyed. But in its familiarity, I, I'm afraid it doesn't carry the weight for us that it should. So I guess I'm saying all that to say I'm, I want to set up how you pray this morning to hear. That you would pray to hear the voice of God speaking to you in the words of Christ. That you would pray to hear the weight of those words fall on you by the power of God's Spirit. That the Spirit speaks to us, we hear and we respond. And if there's any part of us that would dismiss this, for whatever reasons, and I may discuss a few, why we might tend to do that, that this is not for me, or this is not possible, or this is not relevant or practical, that what you hear today would dispel that, and God would replace those, those sort of notions with, with hunger, desire. God that we would live in a way that merits your approval, that grants your blessing, that leads us to real life, knowing that God is ultimately for us. He's for our flourishing, and his word is given to us so that we might, might have life and life to the full. So let's pray to that end this morning. God, awaken our understanding, and Lord, I pray that you would even create in us new desire, enhanced desire, magnified desire if we haven't already, Lord, for you and, and for your word. And Father, I pray that we would approach you today with awe and reverence and, and tremble before what your word says, what you've called us to be and to do and how to live. Father, you've called us to life, to step out of darkness into light, to leave death behind and embrace eternal life, to follow Jesus, our Savior, our King, to be his disciples, to become like him, to live a life that honors him, that reflects him, that makes him known. Uh, so, Father, speak to us, Lord. I pray, this would be, I pray this would be a rich season in the life of our church. I pray it would be a rich season in each of us. Lord, speak to us, I pray, so that we would do this, do these things for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 5 launches this great sermon that Jesus gave. 
Now, if you're reading through this, it won't take you very long. You can get through the whole sermon in about 10 minutes. But I want you to think for a moment that Jesus was teaching, removed himself, went up on the hillside, lots of people gathered around, and then he finished his 10-minute sermonette, and they said, wait, that's it? And then they all went home. Uh, this is probably just what God has preserved for us. It's the, it is the essence of this teaching. It's the, the framework of it. We should rightly expect that Jesus may have taught for hours or even days. You remember some of Jesus' teaching series took days. People came and got hungry and had to be fed. This is a preservation by God's Spirit of what he wants us to know and hear. As you think about the Sermon on the Mount, too, think of it this way. When Jesus began teaching this, he was teaching it to his disciples. Now, I say that word with a sort of a mental asterisk in my mind. When you see the word disciples in Matthew chapter 5, I don't want you to think of it as those 12 men who aren't chosen until Matthew chapter 10. It's not just limited to those men. Think of Jesus in Old Testament terms or first century terms. He's a rabbi, which simply means teacher. It's not a, you know, a religious office. He didn't have an office in a synagogue. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. Rabbis have followers. Those followers are called disciples. Those who are curious and interested, those who want to delve in more deeply, those who want to become like this person or find out at least more about him. So in this sense, it's sort of broad. Jesus is speaking to those that would consider themselves his followers, this first group of followers. But like much of Jesus' teaching, he was difficult, if not impossible, to ignore. So when Jesus began to teach, and of course, if you accompanied that teaching with supernatural works and miracles, he inevitably gathered a crowd. Now, that crowd often came to him with poor motives, as we'll see sometimes in later texts. They came to him with selfish desires. Uh, they came to him seeking things from him. What can you do for me? But many of them, most of them, maybe even all of them, would have considered themselves his followers, his disciples. So when you hear the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing initially his disciples, but he's also addressing those people who think they are, or think they might be, but really aren't. And challenging them to consider all along the way, what does it really mean to me to be my disciples? Consider how the sermon begins. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began saying to them. Again, it's teaching is not just suitable for the disciples. In this sermon, we're going to hear things like this. You're the salt of the earth. Matthew 5, 13. But you're also going to hear at the end of the Sermon on the Mount some warnings for those people who think they're safe spiritually, but they aren't. Who think they're following, but they really are not. Chapter 7, verse 21, we see some of the most frightening words that Jesus ever spoke. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. When Jesus finishes this great sermon, this most famous of all of his sermons, we see this result. Matthew 7, verse 28 and 29. When Jesus finished these sayings, <clears throat> the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Now, this is important for us as we began approaching this text. Jesus taught this as one who had authority. What does that mean? It means, at least on the surface, this. When Jesus was teaching as a rabbi, he was not appealing to the authority of teachers before him. Today, you're going to hear me quote some people, some teachers, some rabbis, if you will, not Jewish, Christian, whom I'm appealing to their insight, to their understanding of this text. I'm going to quote a few. And I'm saying, look what this person saw and what this person thought. When Jesus was teaching, he didn't teach like the other rabbis did. He didn't go to previous rabbis in previous generations or previous centuries and take what they taught as established truth and say, listen, based on rabbi so-and-so, I tell you this. In fact, he did the opposite. He said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. When Jesus was teaching, he was teaching as one who had singular authority. His authority was all his own. It was not wrapped up in anything they'd ever heard or been taught or any person or any school of thought. He had all the authority. He, he's reflecting the very words of Scripture ascribed to him. All authority is given to me on heaven and earth. What does that mean for me and you? For them it meant I'm teaching 
with authority, my own authority. For me and you, it means that Jesus, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who rules and reigns now, not just in the future tense, has every right to make every demand of us that he chooses. If there is one foundational building block I want you to have as we approach the Sermon on the Mount, it's this, Jesus is king. The language he uses is kingdom language. What does it mean for people who would be in my kingdom, under my rule and reign as king? And what do I have a right to tell them, to ask them, to require of them, anything and everything? And so a Christian comes with an understanding of this text, Jesus has the authority to demand of me whatever he will. These aren't symbolic statements. They're not figurative in their language. They're definite, and they're certain, and they're clear, and he has the right to demand of us our obedience to them. When we think of the Sermon on the Mount, maybe make a few notes. I know a lot of this is introductory for where we're going to be for several weeks, but track with me. I don't want you to think of the Sermon on the Mount in the ways that some people have thought of it historically, wrongly. First of all, the Sermon on the Mount is not just a collection of Christian ethics. It's not a social gospel. A lot of secularists, non-Christians, will approach the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, this is Christianity summarized. And, and, and then they'll take the teachings of Jesus and they'll minimize them. So we'll summarize everything in Christianity and say it's all in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we'll even minimize what Jesus says without giving honest attention to the seriousness of the demands that he makes in the Sermon on the Mount. It's just a set of moral teachings. It's a code. It's a guideline. And though these terms may not be used, the way we're really approaching it is, these are suggestions for how we might treat one another better and live in a better world. With the idea that if we began to do these things to some measure, not absolute obedience, not faithfulness, not consistency, but if we began to do these things, wouldn't things be better for us all? We can all live with the teachings of Jesus. Liberal Christianity has often been summarized as those who follow Jesus. What they mean is we take some of the teachings of Jesus, the summary of them, and a condensed, diminished version of them, and we say we follow these teachings. But that's far afield from seeing Jesus as absolute king, demanding of us absolute fidelity. Jesus also is not giving a, an ex, merely an exta, expanded Mosaic law. Some people look at the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, this is like Moses standing there with the commandments of God and saying, here they are, but I'm a new Moses, and I'm expanding these commandments. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus takes the law of God, and he takes it to a whole other level. You're going to hear things like this. You've heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you've lusted in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Certainly that amps it up a level, but does it exceed what God intended from the beginning? I would say no. Just explains it. And some have approached this, and maybe you've even heard teaching this way. Maybe you've heard this in the church. Jesus gives these absolute demands in the Sermon on the Mount so that our response to them would be to recognize our need, knowing we can't keep them, and then it would just drive us to him for grace and forgiveness. In other words, what Jesus is doing really is an extended object lesson of ethical impossibilities only meant to make you aware of your absolute inability so that you'd run to him for grace. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. If we approach the Sermon on the Mount that way, again, only to point out our sinfulness and our need for grace, we're going to miss a major component of what Jesus is doing here. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, said this. He says, Is it not true to say of many of us that in actual practice our view of the doctrine of grace is such that we scarcely ever take the plain teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ seriously? In our doctrine of grace, we, take, we don't take him seriously. We so emphasize the teaching that all is of grace and that we ought not try to imitate his example in order to make ourselves Christians that we are virtually in the position of ignoring his teaching altogether. And we're saying that it has nothing to do with us because we're, quote, under grace. Now, I wonder how seriously we take the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The best way of concentrating on the question is, I think, to face the Sermon on the Mount. So in other words, it's not something that's meant to be ineffective for us, that we're incapable of, simply to redirect our thinking, although it does do that. It is, in fact, written for us to live as God's people to do. And it is not something that simply describes the way life will be in some future age. 
Some have interpreted the Sermon on the Mount that way. That when the kingdom finally comes, which they would interpret as some millennial kingdom in the distant future, then there, with Jesus reigning there, then we live this way. So Jesus is just sort of seeding the, the ground for what none of these people would ever be expected to do. Nor us, for that matter. But that's not true either. The Sermon on the Mount is, in fact, what life looks like normally under the rule and reign of Christ. Those who come under the rule and reign of Christ, you want to know what normal Christian life looks like? And I use that word normal with some sort of air quotes here in my mind. Normal is not typical. It's not what we typically do, but it's what God designed us to be and do under the rule and reign of Christ. It's life that arises out of genuine, honest, committed discipleship with Jesus as our lead. Again, quoting another, John Stott said this. He said, in my mind, no two words sum up the intention of the Sermon on the Mount better or indicate more clearly its challenge to the modern world than this expression, Christian counterculture. Christian counterculture. The essential theme of the whole Bible from beginning to end is that God's historical purpose is to call out a people for himself, he said. That this people is a holy people set apart from the world to belong to him and obey him and that its vocation is to be true to its identity. That is to be holy, different in all of its outlook and behavior. So the Sermon on the Mount is not something impossible. It's something actual. It's something real, not hypothetical. This is what it looks like to be God's people called out from this world living for Christ. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out a right way to live, often in clear-cut choices, this or that, and says, live this way, walk this way, do this. And let me remind you as Christians some foundational thoughts about our obedience to Christ. Jesus died so that you and I could live out the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus died for more than just our eternal destiny. He died more than just to grant us access to heaven. He died so that we could be free and live new lives. Paul wrote about this in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Or we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So what is his death for? Verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What am I saying here? I'm saying that the death of Jesus did more than forgive us. His resurrection did more than offer us justification. It changes us. It transforms us. It enables us. Now, the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount obviously and absolutely show us our need to be born again, to be regenerated. Anybody who thinks they can pick up the Sermon on the Mount, who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ in them, will find these to be utterly impossible. Ephesians chapter 2 At the end of verse 3, says this, We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is who we were, like everybody else. Objects of God's wrath. Why? Because of all of our sins enumerated to some degree in those first few verses. Verse 4 is the hinge pin of hope. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. What's the difference in Ephesians chapter 2 from the old to the new? We were this. But we are this now because of God who has made us new, regeneration. We can't do these things without that. So if you're not a Christian today and you're looking at the Sermon on the Mount as just a basic way to make life better for you, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. But if you are a Christian doing them, the more you practice these things, the more you commit yourself to them, the more you say, God, I believe this is your norm for me. And by the power of your spirit, this is the way I want to live and walk. Then the more you're going to experience God's blessing. It doesn't mean bad things don't happen. It doesn't mean difficult things don't come your way. In fact, some of the blessing that we see in in the Sermon on the Mount includes things like mourning and pain. It means your life will be where God wants it to be. And you'll be in a position of God's approval and blessing. You'll be in a state, a condition that matches God's desire for you. And by doing these things, we... Or promise blessing. Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those. And ultimately for us, we know that our witness is wrapped up in this. I mean, how we look to the world. 
We silence the mouth of the accusers and the skeptics and the cynics, the agnostics and the atheists to a large degree when the way that we live looks like Christ and it looks like the biblical view of Christ. The more we practice these things, the more he blesses us, but also the more we display him for the sake of others. Living these demands, living in this way, is the fruit that demonstrates authentic Christianity. And let me say this as my final sort of introductory statement here for a moment that I think sets it all up for us, which is so critical to hear. So hear this. One thing holds all of this together. One. And it's not your effort, and it's not your skill, and it's not your sincerity. It's not ability or desire. It's grace. It's the grace of God that holds all of this together. First three of the Beatitudes, as we call them, describe for us our, our own spiritual need. When we get to the fourth Beatitude, we see how God promises to meet that need. The other Beatitudes that follow show us the results of God meeting that need. But if God doesn't do this in us, and we're not responsive to him and what he's doing in us, we won't do these things. It's grace that holds it all together, our need for him. So let's look at two critical terms that help us understand what we're talking about here, particularly in that first beatitude and the ones to follow. Key term, first of all, is blessed. Blessed. You might have a modern translation or paraphrase that replaces the word blessed in the beatitudes with the word happy. Now, let me say this for a moment. I'm not anti-happy. I'm actually pro-happy. I, I want to be happy. You want to be happy. Being happy is a good thing. I get it. And I'm not saying that God does not make us happy. I, I think happy can be one of the many fruits of the blessing, but it is not an accurate assessment of what we're talking about here. Because again, as we're going to see in some of these commands and blessings, they're costly, they're, they're challenging, they're painful sometimes. So it's not just that you're going to be happy all the time. Uh, the Greek word is makarios, with which we translate the word blessed. It, it can mean happy, it can even mean carefree. But again, since Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he's not contradicting himself. Happy are those who are sad. No, this is not some sort of psychological mumbo-jumbo that we can't make out. No, sometimes Jesus' disciples are, are poor and hungry. They're suffering persecution and they're, and they're mourning. And yet, they're in a happy situation. They're in an enviable position. They're in a place that other people should also wish to be in because they're where God wants them to be doing what God wants them to do. The best translation of the word makarios for us is the approval of God. It's the approval of God. To be blessed means fundamentally to be approved of. Blessed are those. This I approve of you. And then I can give you these other benefits. And since this is God's universe, God's over everything, what can be better for us than God's approval? I mean, and that kind of goes without saying, right? Whose approval do I want most in this life? Well, wouldn't it make sense to us to seek the approval of the one who is over everything? The one who has control over everything? The one to whom everything belongs? That's whose approval I want. Not somebody else's, not some person, not some group. It's him. And the ultimate blessing that we get when we're doing the things God wants us to do is the blessing of joy, knowing we have God's pleasure. And ultimately, we'll have his reward. We can be in a state of God's pleasure right now. We can be in a hard state. We can be in a difficult state. We can be in a painful state. We can be in a struggling state and still know that we are doing what God wants us to do. God, I want to do what's pleasing to you no matter what. We can be in a state of joy in his good pleasure. But we also know that ultimately we will have his good reward ultimately. The unifying theme in all of this in the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom of heaven. Not just because of how often we see the words kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God appearing, but where they appear in the text. First of all, the kingdom of heaven is the bookends of the Beatitudes. It starts and ends. It's how we gain access to. It's the ultimate aim that we're aspiring to. It's the bookends of the Beatitudes, verses 3 and 10 of chapter 5. When we get to chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, we see the need for holiness. You want to be a part of God's kingdom? Only the holy inherit the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad, as we sang about this morning, and as we declare as we took communion, aren't you glad that the holiness requirements of God to enter into his kingdom are met for us in Christ? Only the holy will see God. Thank God for Jesus, who is our access to the Father. 
It's at the heart of the Lord's Prayer. When we're praying according to the design that Jesus gave, the model that he gave, who are we praying to? We're praying to a king. We're praying to the one who's sovereign. We're praying to one who can answer, who has the authority. But this king is not distant and disconnected from us. He's a father to us who longs to hear our prayers. The basis of our praying is his kingdom and him as king. The kingdom of God, according to chapter 6, verse 33, is our highest and greatest aim. This is what we're supposed to seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Make that first. Make that your priority. Everything else can be added. And then, as I said, it's the ultimate end. It's what we're, it's what we're aiming to enter into. This is where we're going to spend our eternity. This is what we want most. And when Matthew talks about the kingdom, he's talking about the fulfillment of everything that Jesus began to teach in chapter 4. So when we think about the kingdom of heaven, what are we talking about? What is the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it's equated with the reign of Christ. That's how John the Baptist and Jesus could reiterate the kingdom of God is here. John said, repent, the kingdom is coming. Jesus said, the kingdom is here. Repent and believe the gospel. And then immediately after, he said, come and follow me. In what sense is the kingdom here? Well, obviously, it's not fully realized. There's still evil in the world. There's still evildoers. One day, it will be fully realized. But right now... It's partial, it's present and future. But it is the reign of Christ. It's Christ reigning over me. When you come to Jesus for salvation, you're not coming simply to say, let me go to heaven one day. Meanwhile, let me live how I want until that day. You're coming to the one who's the king of kings and lord of lords saying, I want to be in your kingdom. We're coming to him as king. It's a dynamic kingdom right now. It's not spatial. In other words, Jesus didn't say, here's the borderline. Once you cross over this river, you step into my kingdom. That's Israel. Now this is my kingdom. It's dynamic. It's not spatial. It's wherever Jesus rules and reigns. But it's specific. This is different than simply saying, isn't God king over everything? Doesn't God rule everything? Yes, but in a very specific way, those who belong to his kingdom are in this particular kingdom. It's specific. And of course, it's not just about being saved, as I said. It's about Jesus as Lord. Now, what's the first step into that kingdom? You want to be in the kingdom of the only true king, the ultimate and eternal king, the once and coming king, the returning king who will display his glory and power and goodness so that all the earth sees him and every knee bows before him. You want to be part of that kingdom? How do you get there? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, shows us the first step into that kingdom. What does it say? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're trusting in anything of your own, if you're trusting in any goodness of your own, any achievements of your own, any integrity of your own, any sincerity of your own, you fill in any blank there, any blank of your own to get into that kingdom, you're going to miss it all together. To enter into the kingdom of God, you and I have to understand, in light of the awesomeness of God, the holiness of God, the absolute otherness of God, anything good that we bring to that equation, any virtue that we think we offer, any merit that we think would justify our position there, is fruitless. It's, it's useless. We have no merit to offer God, only that which is given us by Christ. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. Let's talk about what poverty of spirit is not just for a moment. Sometimes figuring out what a thing is requires us figuring out what a thing isn't. When we talk about poverty of spirit, we're not talking about a person's personality or natural disposition. Poverty of spirit is not about that. There are people who are introverts and extroverts. Uh, There there are people who are shy and they're outgoing. There are people who are are self-confident, self-assured, And there are people that are prone to self-doubt and and even self-loathing. And we're not talking about a function of your personality. God never said that heaven is for people who are are physically weak or who are intellectually weak or who are emotionally weak. I think you could not accuse Peter of being physically weak. I don't think you could accuse the Apostle Paul of being intellectually weak. I don't think you could accuse either of them of being emotionally weak. And yet they recognize ultimately their great spiritual need, their spiritual inability to approach God. We're not talking about poor personality. We're not talking about God favoring the shy or the nervous or the cowardly. Again, think of an example like Peter. Peter was a man's man. Peter was a tough guy. 
He was a fisherman. You don't survive in that world without being tough. You don't survive in the world that he lived in. Plus, you know, Peter's the, the knife-wielding, little sword, uh, ear-slashing, let's fight them all right now and bring in the kingdom, zealot disciple. But yet, when he encountered the awesomeness of God, and it was in terms that he could understand, God went into his world and showed him himself. Do you remember the story, fisherman? Peter's out with some fishermen. They've been fishing all night. They don't catch anything. And they're frustrated. They're exasperated. They've caught nothing, fished all night. And then Jesus appears on the shore, and he says something which seems a bit ludicrous, honestly. Cast your net on the other side. And again, I'm not a fisherman. I've fished, but I don't know if there's a discernible difference between this side of the boat and the other side where the fish are. And yet they did. And when they did, they brought so many fish they couldn't count them. And what is Peter's response to this? Again, this may seem like just a quaint little story. No, in Peter's world, he knew something just happened here that defies our understanding. This is truly miraculous. And what did he say? When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. However strong his personality might have been, his confidence in himself went away that moment. And he knew that Jesus was the Almighty. That's poverty of spirit. Poverty of spirit is, is not false humility. It's not self-loathing. It's not, it's not telling lies about yourself. It's not trying to convince yourself of your worthlessness. It's not what it is. Poverty of spirit is something different. Poverty of spirit is this. It's full, honest, conscious recognition of your moral unworth before God. Let me say that again. Full and honest, conscious, and I would even say conscientious recognition of your moral unworth before God. It may mean this, you bring a lot to the table, but you do not have what it takes to earn the favor of God. You may have a, a lot of accomplishments, you may have a lot of trophies and awards, but when you stand before the Father, those will be worth nothing. You have nothing that it takes to get there. You're totally dependent on Him. Let me share with you the wisdom of some others. D.A. Carson said, poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. The conscious confession of unworthiness before God. Sinclair Ferguson said it's the recognition that what we are in the presence of God is what we are. No more, no less. Jesus is describing a person who sees his spiritual bondage and is conscious of the debt of his sins. All he can do is cry for mercy. James Montgomery Boyce says being poor in spirit is the opposite to being rich in pride. It's the mental state of a man who's recognized something of the righteousness and holiness of God and has seen into the sin and corruption of his own heart. Charles Spurgeon said this, Christ is never precious till we're poor in spirit. We must see our own wants before we can perceive his wealth. Pride blinds the eyes and sincere humility must open them or the beauties of Jesus will be forever hidden from us. Or maybe something that will speak to you because you can sing it this week. A.M. Top Lady's Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It's good theology. Nothing. Nakeless, naked, helpless, foul. So we fly to the Savior. Where does this come from theologically? This idea of our need and our despairingness over that need. In the Old Testament, we see it in Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And then Paul with his Bible, quotes that psalm in Romans 3, verse 10. As it's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's reality. That's the understanding we have in poverty of spirit. What do we do now? Poverty of spirit is reflected in Isaiah. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6, God gives him a vision of himself he gives him a vision of glory and eternity and, and the limited way that Isaiah could see and perceive. He shows him himself. 
And when Isaiah sees this in chapter 6, verse 5, his response is, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do you see the equation? I guess I'm saying a lot today to say a little. Poverty of spirit begins when you see not yourself rightly, but God truly. When you see God truly, you can't help but begin to see yourself accurately. Isaiah, recognizing his need before God. I am lost. I am undone. Woe is me. I am a sinner. I live among sinners. Would later write of the Lord in Isaiah 57 these words. Thus says the one who's high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you see what Isaiah finally understood? He saw God and it blew him away. It absolutely humbled him. It put him on his face before God. Woe is me, I am undone. He felt in that moment he would surely be destroyed by the holiness of God. But he learns of the heart nature of God. Yes, this ineffable, unapproachable, absolutely different than we are God, holy in everything God, dwells there so far away, so different. And yet he also dwells with the poor in spirit. Those are humble. Those who have a contrite heart. You want to know the God who is the God of everything? You want to know the God who is almighty? Humble yourself and you'll know him. But until we humble ourselves, we'll never know the God of the Bible. So poverty of spirit is the absence of pride, self-assurance, and self-reliance. Poverty of spirit is true and utter God dependence. Poverty of spirit, true and utter God dependence. Think of the people that Jesus received it wasn't those with military accolades. It wasn't those with the zeal of the zealots or the intellect and study of the Sadducees. It wasn't a special race of people known as the Jews. It wasn't the wealthy like Zacchaeus. It was given to the poor, the tax collectors, even the prostitutes who knew their great need and bowed before Jesus. They were so poor they knew they had nothing to offer, and they didn't even try. They came to him only for mercy. So I would say to us, ultimately, that poverty of spirit is necessary for God's approval. And not only for God's approval, but for our flourishing as God's people. This is the beginning. This is the first step into the kingdom. You want to start living the life that God has for you? Then come humbly to him, recognizing your need, and allow the one who meets the needy at the point of their need, who comes and bows to the point of the contrite to meet you there, and God begins to bless your life. Poverty of your spirit is necessary for your salvation. It's recognizing only God can save me. I have nothing to offer. The only thing I bring to the salvation equation is the sin that makes it necessary. Jesus provides all the rest, all the grace. Poverty of your spirit is necessary for my spiritual growth. God didn't simply save you and then leave you alone to do your very best. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The power of God works in you mightily to sanctify you. Poverty of spirit is necessary for useful service. And I use the word, I qualify that statement by using the word useful. I mean useful to God. I'm sure there are plenty of arrogant, self-absorbed, self-righteous, self-dependent people who are prominent in places of service, who are recognized and rewarded, but useful service, that which honors God and builds his kingdom, requires a poverty of spirit. And ultimately, all the privileges of being in God's kingdom are only experienced by those who are poor in spirit. All the promises that you see, the promises of blessing, the good that God wants to do for those who are rightly aligned with him, who are where he wants them to be, doing what he wants them to do, are for those who are poor in spirit. So the challenge is obvious to us. The questions sort of beg themselves. Am I poor in spirit? Am I poor in spirit? Not only will you not come to God for the greatest needs of your life until you're poor in spirit, you won't even recognize the greatest needs in your life until you're poor in spirit. Am I poor in spirit? How do you see yourself before God? See, you may hear what I'm saying today and say, man, this sounds like a, a neurotic sort of message, the sort of message that would just make me feel poorly about myself. That really is not the point. It's the reason we started the service by telling you God is in fact for you. God made you in his image. 
You, you were made with purpose. God has reasons for you. God has a desire for you. God, God wants as a father to bless you. God has good in store for you. The equation, if you're hearing it, you're hearing it wrong if you're simply saying, I just need to abase myself. I, I just need to have sort of a, a monastic approach like we saw in the Middle Ages. You know, the self-abasing, the self-flagellation, how terrible I am, how low I am. No, I'm not saying to base yourself. I'm saying elevate him. See him as he really is, then see yourself in light of him. How do you see yourself in light of God? And what have you done with God's offer of grace? Because only the poor in spirit realize how much they need the grace. When you get to that point of brokenness and, and need, then you say, what else have I? I have no other hope but Christ. How will I ever be set free again? I, I think of Paul crying this out in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's poverty of spirit. It's getting to that point where you see yourself this way. Who will deliver me? How can I ever stand before God like this? How will I ever disavow this? How will I ever deny saying, feeling, thinking, doing this? Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And the very next verse gives us the answer. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't think you're ever going to know the weight, the power, the value of Romans 7, 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord till you recognize the need of Romans 7, 24. Who will deliver me? Who will deliver wretched me? The wretched of us who recognize that honestly and truly will see the goodness of God's grace. And we'll turn to it. And we'll receive it. And that grace is available to you. It's available to any of you who will ask for it today. Any who will seek it. Any who will acknowledge before the Father, wretched me, who will deliver me. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. What's your response today? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for saving all that are saved in this room. Whatever differences may exist among us, these things are common of us all. We are great sinners, but you are a greater Savior. And at some point, the truly redeemed in this room, by an act of your goodness and grace, as painful as it may have felt in that moment, or through a series of experiences, were brought low. We were humbled. We had to wrestle with the weight of our own sin, the seriousness of our own condition, not just remorse about what could have been or should have been. But we had to feel the weight of sin. The greatness of our need. Our deep, irreparable separation from you on our own terms. And Father, at that point of humble contrition, confession, repentance, we found something amazing. We found grace greater than our sin. We found grace. We found great love. We found the good news of Jesus, who while we were still sinners, died for us. Dying to take away our sins, to take the full penalty before you, to make us righteous in your sight, to make us into your own people, Father, a precious possession, a bride to your Son and our Savior and King. We thank you for that. Father, there may be others in this room who are still resistant. Maybe that resistance is simple as, as denying their own need. Maybe still playing the comparison game with other people. Maybe still trying to work this out in their own mind and rational human thinking, which will not stand up to your judgment. Maybe simply who have never considered the greatness and trueness of, of you, Father. And that the God of all the universe, the God of all creation, the God of every law, moral and natural, the God who will judge all the living and the dead, who sent your Son to be a Savior, a mediator for all who would come to him. They're denying the greatness and the goodness of that 
they're neglecting a great salvation, Father. I pray that you change their minds and hearts today if that's so. Lord, seeing our great need, may we also see you as our great Savior and turn to you today. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, thank you for that promise in Jesus' name.